Amen. All right. How many are prepared to be blessed this morning? Yes. How many are prepared to um, <laughs> rise above circumstances? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I, I, lately, as I've been in prayer, I've been, these words have been coming to me, God's perspective. And what I've been looking at is, is we have our ideas and we can read the Bible and different things like this and we have our doctrines and so on and so forth. But I, I, I got thinking, it was, it was a few weeks ago, I was thinking, Lord, what is your perspective? Looking down and looking at us, what is your perspective of the things that we're going through? And a big thing is problems. I notice that God has a different perspective about our problems than we do. Amen? I wanted, so I, I was really interested in that, and so last week I talked about seeing from God's perspective. I'll give you some, some scripture on that. This morning I want to talk about uh, strengthening from God's perspective. Uh, how many in some way, shape, or form this morning, I'm talking to I'm talking to people on live stream or if you're watching here in, in, in the service, how many could use strengthening in this hour? Amen. We look at the problems of the world, we look at different things like this. Uh, I think we can all say it. I don't think there's a, a person that can even look at what's going on today and not find a use for strengthening, encouragement, and so on and so forth. I want to get into this this morning. When it talks about strengthening, um, how many know, there's some people in the world, it, is, it doesn't matter. Uh, why doesn't it matter? Because some people in the world really have little in, uh, appetite for eternity uh, because they have no investment there. People don't have an appetite for eternity or the things that God has promised because they don't have an investment there. But on the other hand, those that have an investment there are looking to do His will and to carry out His will in what, what He wants to do on earth. How many, that, how many of those people do I have in here this morning? Okay, thank you, Jesus. You were getting quiet there. It's not that place. I wanted to hear an amen, and I wasn't hearing anything. I praise the Lord. Amen. I wanted to share uh, this morning one of the, I've shared this story several times, but from a, I want to share this on a different angle this morning uh, than what I've shared before. I want to, I'm going to be uh, spending some time in the first Samuel and um, talking about David. Um, David's one of my fa favorite uh, of the Old Testament patriots. David's one of my favorites. Uh, from the time he took on Goliath, uh, uh, the lion, the bear, until the time he was, uh, became king. How many would agree that in David's time there was a turmoil? From the time he got victory on Goliath until the time he actually took over the throne, there has been nothing but turmoil in his life. Amen. And you say, but wait a minute, this guy Samuel is the one that he... he, he uh, poured his oil. He took it out of all the house of Jesse. He went down all through his brothers. But it was David who was out in the field. He wasn't even invited to the meeting. Uh, uh, Samuel had to call him forth. And, and, and this was it. And he opened up his horn of oil. He said, this is the next king of Israel. At that point there, nothing really changed immediately. But from that point there, God, how many would agree God was working with David? And he had to take a shepherd boy who was a shepherd and turn him into a king. There's a big difference between watching a flock, being a farmer, and kingship. Of course, it wouldn't be the first time God went to the farming fields to find a, the next leader or prophet. I'll share that in, in a minute. But one thing David, well, I mean, no, Samuel can be trusted as a prophet because basically it says this about Samuel in 1 Samuel. I'm just going to quote some things here. You can write them down. 1 Samuel 3.19 says this, it says, so Samuel grew in the Lord. That was a prophet that prophesied over David. He grew in, in the Lord and, was, and the Lord was with him. And listen to what he says. This is what the Lord says about Samuel. None of his words fall to the ground. May none of his words fall to the ground. Now, that's a biblical expression that means, in other words, everything he said came from heaven. And none of it fell on the ground as, as, as worthless. Every, his words are valuable. So I want, to, I want to build this point before I get into talking about David. But I, I understand something. Saul, uh, Samuel would not, would not uncork his oil for anybody else but David. Right. And God is the only one thing that he told uh, uh, Samuel to do. He said, find me a man because he's going to replace Saul because Saul wasn't going in a direction. He wasn't uh, obeying God. He said, he's going to be replaced. Find me a man has a, that, uh, that is after my heart. He didn't say which man. You read the scripture again. He didn't say 
Go find David because David's a man. No, he didn't, he didn't mention David at all. He told the prophet, he says, you find me a man that is after my heart. I want to make him king. So there's, there's the plan laid out. So, of course, you know this story about David and Goliath and so on and so forth uh, uh, of what happened. And then all of a sudden when David was victorious, he was brought into the palace. Uh, he really removed a large embarrassment from Israel by taking out Goliath. Nobody else wanted to take on this guy. He had the, uh, the, the armies of Israel just shaking in their boots. And this young teenage boy got up there and he says, I'll do it, and, and stands up there and takes out Goliath and so on and, and, and made a great victory uh, for Israel. And it's interesting. Even in that act that he knew God intervened, he did not let a prophecy go to waste. He's going to be king. He knows he's going to be king. He took out the opposition to Israel at the time, but David wasn't king at that time. But he took the sword of Goliath and he lopped off his head and he did something that's unusual. People don't usually pick up in the Bible. But he took the head and he held it up high outside of Jerusalem. There's only one problem with that story. Jerusalem was not the capital of Israel. Hebron was. Uh, important place. I don't know if it was the capital, but it was an important place. Hebron is where uh, uh, Abraham uh, uh, and, and Sarah were buried. I mean, just the, the father and mother, the covenant, the whole thing in, in Hebron. But Jerusalem wasn't called Jerusalem at the time. It was called Jeshu, and it was, was held by the Jesuits. In other words, uh, uh, um, uh, the, 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 um, Joshua conquered all of the promised land except Jerusalem. So David comes up. Now David is, is exceeding in his prophecy and his, and, his, and his ideas of what God is going to do. He takes the head of the giant and he holds it up outside of Jerusalem. What's he saying? Prophetically he's saying this was your hero. This is the, this is the strongest man uh, in our country. This is, this, this is the enemy. And I'm holding his head. That makes me the victor. God has made me the victor over this thing here. You are next. You are next. And of course, they, you know, they, they laughed at David and everything because they had the great walls around Jerusalem and all, all this other stuff. So there's where David starts off. This is how he starts off. He goes out and he fights. He, he, uh, Saul takes him into the palace. He goes out and he fights wars. The problem with David and Saul was this. David was too successful for Saul. So David was being persecuted by the king of Israel because he was successful. At that particular place, jealousy overruled Saul to a point where David was hounded by him. 10, 10 to 13 years, he was, on, he, he was in exile. Are you following the story here? This is the same David that Samuel put his oil on. This is the same David that God says he's going to be the next king. But the previous king is trying to kill the next king. So Saul isn't acting like the gracious king of Israel. He's acting more like the mob boss of the mafia. I don't like this guy. I'm jealous of him. Let's get rid of him. Let's rub him out. And rub out anybody who stands in his way. Saul even went as far as having the priest killed because when exiled David came to the, to the temple, the priest handed him Goliath's sword back again. He fed him, gave him provisions, and sent him on his way. And for that, they lost their life. Saul had them killed. This is the evil. Why was it? Jealousy. All over jealousy became such a, a rage within Saul that David could not rest. This is how ironic this thing becomes is because I'm going to pick up the story at Ziglag. And Ziglag was a, was a Philistine, uh, strong, uh, Philistine uh, town. In other words, the Philistines, okay? <laughs> the arch enemies of Israel opened their arms to David because they were so impressed by this guy. And he gave, they, the Philistines actually gave David his own city, and his city was Ziglag. <laughs> Try to wrap your head around this. Wait a minute. Goliath was a Philistine, right? David was the killer of Goliath, but, his, but David's uh, em, em, employment with, with, with engaging in the enemies of Israel. He so wiped out the enemies. He, they were so impressive. David had 400 100 men uh, to start out with. He wound up about 600 men. I think 800 after that. But uh, he had about 400 men, which really in, in, in the standards of the day 
was not a big force to reckon with armies, especially the Gentile armies. They, they, were, they were armed to the teeth. They were strong. That's how they were, that's how they were uh, ravaging Israel and taking over the land because of their strength. And David was whipping them. He was whipping them. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I put this in my notes because I, I want to give you some more background. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on David. And I, want to, I want to shift gears, but it's important to understand the background. I'm going to relate the background of David to some of the things that we see today. But let me, let me go first of all. Let me go. First Samuel chapter 22. You can turn your Bible there if you want to. Uh, I'm just going to read the first two verses, one, verses 1 and verse 2. So second, uh, First Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the caves of Adullam. He's on the run from Saul. He's going to escape Saul when he goes to the caves of Adullam. Can I give you some personal uh, 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 testimony on the caves of Adullam? When I was in Israel a few years ago, I asked my brother-in-law, who's an Israeli, and uh, he also served in the IDF. He was also a, a sniper in the IDF, and he had the lay of the land, especially around Jerusalem, especially all, all over the country, not just especially, but I mean, I asked David, Isaac, I says, Isaac, I said, is it possible to find a place of the caves of Adullam? Well, as soon as I mention anything about David, he lights up. Now, he lives in the land of Jesus, south of the Galilee. But when I mentioned David, he lit up. Oh, yeah, we can get on board with that. <laughs> and he says, I can show you the area. I can take you there. He said, I was there when I was in the IDF. He said, I can show you the place there outside of Jerusalem uh, where, where, the, where Adullam would be. There's no signs, there's no historical things marking this out, but this is what I noticed. Now, this is my, my aspect. He took me to this place, and we did find caves. Now, I'm thinking, because I come from mountainous areas when I, where I was born and brought up, I'm thinking you got a mountain here and, and a hole in the side, they call it a cave, correct? <laughs> so you go in, walk up the mountain, you go inside it, and you're in a cave. Uh-uh, not here. Israel is mostly limestone, and the caves that are under, in Adullam are underground. Are you following me? We found one cave. We almost fell in because it, it was a hole in the ground. Flat. Ground. Hole. When we walked around, a little bit of a ledge there went in, and you found a whole big cavern that just opened up. And, of course, Bedouins and stuff would, would, would graze their, still to this day, graze their flocks there. And they would use those caves for shelters and so on and so on. But here's what, listen to this strategy of this shepherd boy who was now a warrior. He went underground, the caves of Adullam. He wasn't just hiding, but the caves of Adullam allowed him to pop up where nobody knew it would be, where they would be. As they're looking out over a, a blank field or, or just a flat ground, all of a sudden right next to him, a guy could pop up and kill him. He had the perfect setup because he was not only concealed, but he's also able to attack from that concealment. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so this is it's really cool. I, I, I took some pictures and stuff. I really, I really like that. I said, this is the area. Isaac said, yeah, this is the area. This is where Dolan would be. And we don't know the exact cave, and I don't think anybody does. Uh, and there's nothing marked for a historical sign. But what impressed me was the, the, the geological layout of this thing and how they... Man, they could pop up any place. And, she, and, and I mentioned that to my brother-in-law. He says, yeah, he says, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a pretty, pretty good tactic. So he says he's at the caves of Adullam, second, uh, 1 Samuel 20, 22, 1 and 2. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the caves of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's uh, house heard it, they went down there uh, uh, to him. And everyone, listen to this. Because there was a procession from David's family followed, they went to see David. There was a whole procession from his, from his town, all people from all around uh, going, to find, going to see David. Okay? Everyone that was in distress, that's what it says, everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered unto him. Talk about David. I call him the 3D gang. <laughs> so you qualify to serve with David, who is going to be the next king of Israel, because you are distressed, in debt, and discontented. Wow. <laughs> we just talked about half the church. <laughs> Wait a minute. This ain't covered word church. This is a case with Dolom right here. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> and they were discontent. They gathered unto him, and listen to this. So he became captain over them, and there was about 400 men with him. What does that have to do with David on the run? Because now that's the problem. We see the problem. We see our problems. How many could, if I, if I had the hand show, how many have problems this morning? Okay? I hope not with me, but I mean, we got, you got problems. But, but okay, we have problems. So how much of a center focus is your problem? Because David seemed to make a shift here. He's got nothing but 400 guys that are in debt, discontented, and everything, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing. They're just, I mean, they're a mess. David's got a mess. But he becomes their captain. What does that look like? I'm captain of the mess. <laughs> yep. My church, we got nothing but problems, man. I mean, this guy over here, he got, oh, oh, man, you don't believe, you wouldn't believe this person over here. We don't tote those things around. No, we want to see the victory of Christ. We want to see, no, we're, if we're following God, he should put us on top. If we're not following God, we're going to be underneath. These guys are underneath. Some literally. But how can we say, what's happening here? This is an important point. Not this one here, but where David's going to do next is what I want to drill home. Because what I found out in studying this and preparing for this, I found a key for the church today that we're overlooking. Amen? Well, some of us are. You know, we might do some of these things by accident, but I want to show you on purpose this morning. Are you here? Was David still in relationship with God? Wait a minute. You say yes. You say he was in relationship with God, but he had all these problems. Are you kidding me? How can somebody be in relationship with God and have all these problems? That's what we say today in the church. Because, you know, the people, you know, if, if it's going good, God has opened up a door for me. But if it's going bad, mm -mm, I must have stepped out of his will somehow. This is how we've been trained in church to think, and I'm telling you, it's wrong. When trouble and turmoil comes from God, it's never punishment. But he does look for a purpose in promotion. <laughs> now, I'm probably not going to get you to rejoice over your problems this morning, but the fact is, he gives opportunity for promotion. Now, I didn't say what I did not say. I did not say God causes problems. God does not put sickness and disease on people. No, that's under the redemption. It's under grace. It's just been taken care of. Jesus paid the price for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when a real devil comes and he puts things on you, depression and, 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 and debts and all these other things. Debts aren't just financial things. Debts can be uh, what you feel you owe people. <laughs> Do I dare step on this ground? <laughs> See, some people will forsake God because they feel they owe their employer something. <clears throat> they feel they're in debt to their employer. Amen? <laughs> okay, so you see you're part of the 3D gang too. Amen. Even with all your bills paid, you're still part of the 3D gang. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Keep on preaching, Kevin. Yeah, we're going to get this thing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so here's David on the run with 400 malcontents, discontents, and this is church. And God is still whispering in his ear, you're the next king. I'm going to do great and mighty things through you. Do you look great and mighty? You're underground like a gopher. You got 400 malcontents, discontents, and all they can do is complain. You're on top of the world, David. <laughs> you see how ludicrous it sounds today, but this is exactly what God was doing. He was positioning David for promotion, not for punishment. Promotion. But we have to look past the trouble that the devil wants us to look at. We have to look on the other side of that to the promotion God wants us to do. I'm telling you, I, I talked, I don't know how many ministers when I first came to Key West, and I, I used to say it jokingly, I said, who, who in your denomination did you tick off to send you here? One guy told me, he said, I don't know, but I'm going to make it right with him. <laughs> Actually thought he was sent here on punishment. I was sent here on purpose. 
And the, and the difficulties as I go over 34 years in this town of ministry that we planted in this ministry. And I look over these 34 years, and at the time, I even thought, my God, did I do something wrong? Do I need to repent, Lord? And he's saying, no, you're doing great. Keep on going. Great. I get half the town hates me. Good. Hallelujah. You're changing things. I'm serious. I am serious. He said, I did not call you to this place to be part of this society. I called you to this place to be a light to this society, to pull them out of darkness. And we've got thousands over the years that we've been able to do that with literally thousands. It blows my mind to even think about it sometimes. So here's David. He's out on a run. He's living in Philistine land because he's not, he's exiled from his own country. He's not allowed to go back without being killed. Matter of fact, David went to one town and uh, it, it was an Israeli town, and um, the Philistines were, were, were attacking, and he uh, went to war with them, and he freed the town. That night, he's in, spending time in the Lord. He says, uh, are these people going to turn me into Saul now that I got the victory for them? And God said, they surely will. And he got up in the middle of the night, took his men, and he left. He says, well, some people will turn on you if it's, if it, if it's gain for themselves, like Judas like Judas. Amen? They're amongst you, but they ain't for you. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. So David has a town given to him by the Philistine, because the Philistine king just thought he was some hot rod, even though he was an enemy of of the Philistines. We'll give you your own town. You take Ziklag. So David's out on one of his patrols. He's out uh, doing, and, and they come back, and all of a sudden, they look over the hill, and there's plumes of smoke and fire going up. It's Ziglag is set on, on fire. He goes down, he, he goes down to the city. He, the women and children, everybody is taken. All their food, all, their spo- all, the, all the things are spoiled that the Amalekites could carry well, they carried away. Amalekite, by the way, understand there's a spirit. It's a certain demonic spirit that operated in the ancient times. Today you know it as terrorists. You know it as Hamas and all those organizations because they prey on civilians and they use human shields. Why did not David, both of his wives were kidnapped. Why did they not be killed? Because they were going to use them as hostages. And Israel's in a war like that again. So this isn't, this, this, this isn't, this isn't new news. This is old news. But that's what it is. The Amalekites were the ones that first attacked Israel coming out of uh, Egypt when they were being free. And they attacked from behind, and they got the weak and the innocent, the women and the children, is what they attacked and killed first. And then they would, they would hide and they'd come out, and they would attack, and they would hide. Amen? So this is, the, this is the Amalekites. This was their way of battle. This is how they fight. And this is who take, took over Ziklag. And now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. At the, so he was going for three days. On the third day, the Amalekites had invaded uh, the south, and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burning it with fire. And they had taken captive, in verse 2, they had taken captive the women and those who were of, of small to great. They were not, did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So they took everybody. Small and great means little children, uh, wives, uh, uh, wives of leaders like David. Okay, so those would be the great. So great and small, they took everybody. They had hostages is what they had. And basically they took all their food. So David is in distress at this point, and um, so he talks about talks about David's two wives. David went in, uh, went into people. He said, uh, "Let me jump down to um, verse six. Now David was greatly distressed. Uh, I imagine he would be, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his son and his daughter. Makes makes sense to me. Nothing out of the ordinary here. I would be grieved if it was my my kids and my family, wouldn't you?" And, uh, and so, so uh, they, were, and they were greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because of the souls of the people were so grieved, every man for his son or his daughter. But listen to this. David did something different. He didn't focus on the problem, though the, he had to overcome the problem. Remember, David is their captain. What they want to do, they want to stone him because they're going to blame David for getting him into this position. <laughs> See, this wouldn't have happened if you didn't go to Key West. 
this wouldn't have happened if you know you stayed up here, you stayed in Deerfield, you, if you stayed in Boynton, this wouldn't have happened. This only happened because you moved to Key West. Well, I, I, I can relate to a certain degree, not to what David was going through, of course, but I mean, uh, uh, but it, this, is the, this is the phrase that gets me, and I want to share this this morning because I believe this is a key that we can pick up today. I'm going to give you some uh, other examples. I don't give just take one example. So now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the souls of all the people were grieved, every man for his son and his daughter. In other words, they were focused on exactly the loss. They were not focusing on the solution. David had the same kind of loss. He had the same kind of opportunity to grieve, but David did something that they didn't do. It said, David strengthened himself in the Lord. David got his weakness overcome by the courage and the strength from God. The priest was there because the priest brings him the ephod. Ephod was an article of clothing that we brought and prayed with to, for the will of God to come forth. Think about this. Think about how we deal with problems today. The problems can so affect us that we, don't, we cannot worship God. The problems can so affect us we don't go to church. The problems can so affect us that we just separate ourselves. How does it work for you? It doesn't work for me at all. I learned this lesson from David. I'm still learning it, by the way. I'm not, I'm not arrived, but I learned this lesson. David did something here that is absolutely superb. He didn't blame God for calling him into the ministry, for doing this. This is all your fault, God. I wouldn't have been on the run. I wouldn't have been in this country. It wasn't for you. And it's all, why don't you deal with Saul? Why don't you just kill him and make me king? He could have done all those things that we would go over today. He didn't rehearse any of that in his mind. Amen? Why? Because that would be problem devil focused if we said it today. That's focusing on what the demon. Why can't you just stop the devil? There's a good reason God doesn't stop the devil. He told you to. The problems that David was going through, now none of his family were killed. We're only talking about stuff here. Okay? The thing is with, with the Amalekites were not led by the Lord, Spirit of the Lord, and God did not in, infuse the Amalekites to attack David to teach him a lesson. Forget that nonsense. He didn't do that. The Amalekites operated on their own, just like the devil operates on his own. The devil doesn't ask permission from God before he attacks you. Right. He's not serving God. You are. He attacks you sometimes because you are serving God. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. David gets the ephod and he seeks the Lord. This is one of my favorite parts. He strengthened himself in the Lord. He didn't strengthen himself when the Lord spoke to him. He strengthened himself before he got the ephod. If you read this, the, the text, he strengthened himself and then he asked for the priest to bring him the ephod. He refused to go into the presence of God in a weakened condition. I am not going to sit there with a poor me. Look, look at this God. Look what they did to me. No, not at all. Brush it off. Wash your face. Stand up. All right, God, give me the plan. He says, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God says, you shall surely pr uh, pursue. You will overtake. And this is what God adds on the end. David didn't ask for this. He said, you will recover everything. Everything the enemy has stolen, you recover it. How am I going to do that? I got a team of men that want to kill me. We come up with all the excuses. We come up with all the reasons why things won't work in the church. I got people that want to kill me. How am I supposed to, these are the men, the very men that I helped them, the very people that I ministered to, the very people, they want to kill me. What am I going to use to go after and pursue these people? They're going to kill me. He could have come up with 100,000 excuses and write them all down and say, okay, God, what about this? Has it happened yet? What I want to point out is our mind can prophesy without the permission of God or ourselves. Simply the problems. The problems can never be the prophecy of the Lord. They have to be separated. If I have a problem, I'm not just looking for a solution to the problem. Understand the problem. The problem is a step up to my promotion. What I'm focused on is the promotion. David had to be a king. 
Samuel didn't make him a king. Samuel only anointed him with the call of God and the purpose of God. Saul made him the king that he was supposed to be. Because a king cannot back down from problems. A king cannot be all tied up in his personal stuff and his emotions and then forget who is called him to be king. This was a, this was a promotion for David. David didn't call it that. Maybe he didn't see it that. All I know is this is what I know to do. Go to God. Lord, what do you want me to do? Now the next words that come out of God's mouth are going to be, are going to be it. That is going to be testament. That's going to be law. That's not going to be changed. This is what you're going to do. You aren't going to question it. You aren't going to say, I cannot do that. You're not going to back off from that. You're going to do that. Oh, this is great. All of a sudden, I don't know what happened because the Bible doesn't share this, exactly the details. David comes out somewhere point. He's got to address these men that want to kill him. They're all grieving. They, they had a bad they, they had a bad day, they had a bad month. I, this, is, this is bad. Everything that they've done and accomplished, all the victories, every time they get a victory, somebody's trying to kill them. David's trying to be punished by Saul because he's, he's successful. This is what jealousy does. Amen? It wants to get you off the mark of what God says. He said, no, you'll pursue them. And don't you know, as a, somehow, when David stepped out of his role as a grieving husband and stepped into his role as king and anointing, something snapped. And all of a sudden, that 600 men that were following him, right behind them, bingo, they're there. We're there with you. What happened? What happened to the stoning? Where's the, where's the lynch mob? Where, where's, where's the you know, mutiny? <laughs> when David stepped out from the ephod, he said, I've got a direction from God. Let's go get him. And they said, yeah, we're on board. We're on board. What happened? David didn't shrink back because of the problem. He would have flunked the test. Instead, he moved forward in the opposite direction that he, his humanity and his brain probably is telling him. Pursue with what? We don't have any food. We know they didn't have horses. You know David didn't ride a horse? Did you know that? You know why David didn't ride a horse? Because horses were under the band, because only horses that were available came from Egypt, and they were under the band. Only Solomon broke the band. <laughs> he got horses anyway, but David didn't have any horses. They had donkeys and mules, but they didn't have any, because they could grow them themselves. But they didn't have horses. So it's not like they all mounted up like in, in the Western you know, like, yeah, 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 we're right after them, you know, and, and run them down. No, it wasn't that at all. They were on foot. No food, no provisions, no water, nothing. All of a sudden, they come across this guy laying in the field that was an outcast. And he says, if you don't kill me, if you take me with you, I'll tell you where they're at. So all they need is a shortcut to the location. Amen? Shortcut to the location. And they pursued it, and they took, overtook him. The only ones that escaped is the one that had camels. That's it. So you guess what? When they, saw, when they saw David coming, they had mounted their camels, and they were running in the opposite direction. Why? Because they're terrorists. They never stand face to face and fight people. They're cowards. Just like they are today. They're cowards. They stand behind women and children. Amen? Amen. And they hope the press does their work for them. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let me move on. So here's what it was God didn't start the problem, God didn't cause David to be exiled. That was Saul. God didn't cause the Amalekites to come in and steal everything from him. But God was going to get it all back. This is what you got to understand. Can I put something here? I do not want you to misunderstand no way, shape, or form. But this is the difficult part of this message that I want you to hear clearly. Clearly, clearly. There's a spiritual principle that God put in this Bible for us today. And that is to be able to minister to ourselves. Now I said that. I did not say that's all you need. I did not say that you, well, if I minister to myself, what do we need you for? I didn't say that. I will never say that. Here's why. 
Are you ready for this? Are you listening now? Okay. David got his information from God, pursued the enemy to overtake this. Yes. Himself. He ministered to himself. He pulled himself up out of the depression and out of the grief, and he went with God's plan. But do you know when he asked God, can I build your temple? You know what God did? He went silent. Not a single word. Nothing. But God, I want to build a temple for you. I want all the glory. I want to build all the glorious temple, and I want to glorify your name. Nothing. Do you know how God talked to David then? Through the prophet Nathan. Why? God was not going to bypass the gifting of the prophet for David's own privilege. And he won't do it today. He's gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the, uh, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. God is not going to bypass that and let you get it all on your own, or me for that matter. Amen? So I did not say that it's an exception to the body of Christ at all. I know the generation. I know our culture we live in today. Okay? But can I share something with you? How many here have ever been in a, a meeting, a big convention, maybe a, a conference, where they have healing miracles? And they definitely had healing miracles. Then you come back to the local church and it kind of, then it kind of calms down and kind of just, you know, not as much. Isn't it the same God? Isn't it the same Holy Spirit? What happened? What's the difference between the big conference that has them? There? Oh, I see anointing that he puts on the speakers. I bet some of these speakers. I got news for you. It isn't man. It isn't by man's tuition. I don't care how, many, how much you fast, pray, and everything else. It isn't by man's works. It's by the Spirit of God. But here's what I noticed. This is my observation. If a person's going to a conference that's all billboarded, miracle healings here, how many here, and, and, and this ministry has had so many miracles over here. They go on the past records. This is so what happens is people get hepped up and go there believing. And God looks at their faith, and he moves. There's no reason why that can't happen in a local church or anyplace else, except religion taught you to treat the church differently than you treat a conference. Has not the pastor laid down his life for the benefit of other people? Just like the conference. Has not the pastor preached the same word that they preach at the same conference? Don't we believe the same things? That's not a matter of belief. But what's menacing in a local church, a lot of, this is my observation now, this is not every church, I'm not, not grouping it here, I'm not, this is my observation. As at some places, maybe we're missing the self-ministering. Let me just, let me talk about right here. What if I had a team of 20 people, and we have a person here, one person, that needs a miracle? Uh, it would be cancer or whatever. I took just 20 people out of the congregation and say, okay, pray for this person. Now, I taught on self-ministry, and the same 20 people come now, but they've been spending time with God. They weren't too busy for this. They weren't too busy for the Bible reading. They weren't too busy for the prayer and all the other things. But they come now expecting. And all of a sudden, they have a personal investment because God told me this, this, is it. this is, needs to be healed. God will do the healing and the miracle. And we start believing. Which 20 people do you want to pray for you? Does a self-ministering do away with it? Did it do away with get David's kingdom? Absolutely not. Did, it, did God just bypass all the prophets and didn't speak anymore? Absolutely not. No. And he wouldn't. He wouldn't say anything to David. David could hear so clearly with such detail about going after the Amalekites. Could now hear nothing about building the temple, though he was collecting materials as a king. Why? Because God wasn't going to bypass the ministry of the prophet. That's what the prophet's ministry was about. He wasn't going to bypass his ministry. Why? Because he had a call on his life too. And what happens is each one of us that have a call in our life come together. And we've been in, in that self-ministry, that place with God sticking in. I'm not so, so, saying, well, it's having a relationship with God. I know you're going to, you're going to mimic some of the things I say. Well, well, let me ask you something. At Ziglag, when David showed up and his house is on fire and his wives have been kidnapped, did David have a relationship with the Lord? 
Of course he did. Of course he did. It wasn't about having a relationship with God. Well, I'm a spiritual person. Yes, and so is the devil. <laughs> I had a guy come up to me on a, on, or on a dive boat, and, I, and he said, it was, just, it, was convo, it was classic, it was classic. And he says, well, and out of the clear blue, he knew as a pastor, he, I, I know him, I mean, we're, we're friends, and he comes to me and he, and he says, he, said, he says, um, you know, I believe in Jesus. I said, man, bro, that's good. That's good. I said, so is the devil. <laughs> you know, where are we at here? I said, I laid my life down to serve him. <laughs> that's the difference. And he was a dive instructor, you know, and different things like that. I could share some. I didn't get into it with him because they all like me down there. <laughs> but but it, this is the thing. Amen? What about this? Encouraging yourself in the Lord, then coming to church. How many eat breakfast on Sunday morning? Yeah, take time for that, huh? Really? We're only a short service. You can wait till after the service to eat, can't you? A little fasting wouldn't hurt you, you know. Get, uh, that tongue in cheek. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Amen. Sure, we do. We have time for everything else. What if we took some time? and leaned into the presence of God. Say, God, how can I go to church this morning and make a difference in somebody else's life? Mm-hmm. Minister, that's, self, that's what I'm talking about. That's the definition of self-ministry. You're not, exi- if you are, are s- claiming self-ministry, I do not need the body of Christ, you're lying. And you're going against the very will and the very word of God. I can't, I can't get on board with that. Sorry. But if you're saying, you know what? If I come down there Sunday morning, Tuesday night, whatever, whenever we get together, and if I can put my gifting into this thing that God has placed on me, and then the other person next to me puts their gifting into this also, and this person over here, what happens? All of a sudden, our alignment and our focus is God-centered. Now, we pray. We're not thinking about this. We're not thinking about this problem, that problem. Listen, everybody's got problems. I'm not making light of the problems, but has it got your focus? Fears. Oh, you got to be kidding me. There's more fears in the church than outside the church. I hang around with some of these people that don't go to church, you know, to, to the dive industry. They're fearless, some of them. When, when the people in church, aren't you afraid of sharks? No, only when they're gnawing on me. They don't do that. I got to run half of them down to get a picture of them. Fear. Praise the Lord. Amen. I got two minutes. I'm going to share this in two minutes. Praise the Lord. I'm going to talk fast, so you're going to have to listen quick. (laughs) I had this in my I had this in my notes now for for three weeks. I got to get this out. I'll I'll, I'll go over it. I'll give you the scripture references, but I'll 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 just talk you through it. Praise the Lord. Is that okay? How many y'all remember the story of Elijah? And Elijah. Okay, Elijah is plowing a field. Elijah the prophet, you know the story, comes over and he throws his cloak on him and walks away. Doesn't say a word, walks away. And uh, Elijah obviously knows what it means. He runs after the prophet, say, please let me go ahead and take care of this and my, my stuff at home. And, and, uh, and, and the prophet turns to him and says, what do I have to do with you? And just shuns him, cold, blank, cold. Elijah doesn't say another word. He goes back, he slaughters the oxen. He was plowing the fields with 12 years ago. Slaughtered the oxen, gave it to the help uh, for food, uh, uh, burned the plows, and took up everything he had in the field and followed that man. Why did he do that? Because the call of God had to be greater than the call of a person. I know this well. I had a pastor like that. I first got sent out, I was, uh, my pastor laid hands on me, he, he prophesied that I would be a uh, pastor, I had, I had the word, I was just too afraid to do something with it, so I, I was at church one night and he prophesied, called us out, a word of knowledge called us out, and, this, and then I did, I started my first church up in Boynton Beach and we went out and the, the pastor was delighted and he helped us and different things like that. And one day I looked at it and it wasn't working out the way I thought. So I said, 
I said, Pastor Joe, can I have a meeting with you? And he says, absolutely, come on down. And so I went to, to his office and had a meeting. I says, I says, am I doing something wrong? So, this should be working, this should be working, this should be working. What would happen was we just come off a revival. And that was that lull right in there when we first started our first church. And that's what was happening. People were just forsaking the house of the Lord and different things like that. So he says, well, he says, um, I don't know what you're doing. He said, but if you think this is a, a, a mess, he says, uh, or you don't think this is God, he said, come on here and sit back down. Wait a minute. You just laid hands on me. You prophesied the word of the Lord. Now you tell me to sit down? See, I, I understand this. In other words, what my pastor was trying to get across, or what Elijah was trying to get across, the call of God on your life better be bigger than somebody else approving it. And it wasn't about the approval. What happened is he served Elijah. Elisha served Elijah for six years. Did you know that there were two schools of prophets that Elijah had started? There was one in Bethel and there was one in Jericho. And do you know those same students that he had were mocking Elijah? Elisha? And when it was time for Elisha to go, he says, you stay here. That was at the first school. He says, no. He says, through the Lord liveth, I'll follow you. I'm going to go to the end. Because he says, the Lord's taking me this day. He stops at Jericho. Fifty of those prophets, sons of the prophets, they call them. It was a school of prophets, what it is. He didn't have all those sons. <laughs> it was a school of the prophets. But that's what they called the sons of the prophets. Fifty of them came out and began to mock. What are you going to do? Your father's leaving. Your spiritual father, he's going back to be with the Lord. This is the school of prophets knew this. What are you going to do now? You're all by yourself. They're mocking him and they're laughing at him. Isn't it amazing that even though the school of prophets was started by the prophets that were called and ordained by God, God did not go to the school of prophets to find the next prophet? <laughs> not a one. We know there was 50 of them in one school. So I can say there was probably 100 or more. And God didn't take one person out of the school of prophets but he saw one old farmer. Does that sound familiar with David? One old shepherd. One person that you wouldn't even think a God could even use. And they rose up to be the greatest. So what does he ask? He, so finally, Elijah says, okay, if you see me where I'm going, ask me anything, I'll, I'll give it to you. He says, I want twice your anointing. How do you give somebody twice of what you don't have? <laughs> but he, he says, if you see me when I go, here comes another test. I love these tests, especially when you don't know their tests. He said, you see me when I go. He said, you'll have what you ask. Two things happened. A chariot of fire came down and a whirlwind. The Bible is clear. Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. If I had my eyes on the chariot, I would have lost a double portion. When he looks up at the whirlwind, he takes, doesn't take his eyes off Elijah. Elijah's coat, the mantle fell down. That one on him that first day in the field comes down and now it's landed at his feet. He picks it up just like Elijah did. He rolls it up and he strikes the same water. And he says this, he says, where is the God of Elijah? What was he doing for the last six years? He's making breakfast. He's taking care of his laundry. He's taking care of the guy. He's serving. In that serving, what, he, what, what, what was happening is Elisha was ministering to himself along with the service of the prophet. When it came to the day, he knew exactly what he was listening for. He knew exactly what to ask God for. And do you know how many miracles he had? Exactly double of what Elijah had. Twice the, twice the gifting. But he didn't take his eyes off of him. In self-ministry, we cannot take our eyes off of God's corporate. Can't do it. You've got to focus on that. In self-ministering, it's not just, well, we have this as a supplement against it. No, it's not even a supplement. It's an addition too. But if we could get our church here, any church for that matter, could come together and get you to self-minister, to build yourself up, now come together with a common cause, look out. We can change the city. How do I know that? Three men, Peter, James, and John. Upturn side of the city. Why? Because they learned about self-ministry. Paul. Then 
cast out that devil out of that girl. They beat him, him and Silas, they beat him and threw him in the inner parts of the prison. What does he do when he's beaten, he's bloody, he's darkened, he's in a prison, he's Ill- illegally captured because he was a Roman citizen by his mother being a Roman. So they, they had a, he had a case against him. And he sits there, he's not thinking about that. He's not thinking about how to get even. All of these things, you know, here's what we do. Let's self-minister. Can't do anything else. We can't go anyplace. Can't, get the, can't go to the body of Christ for people to pray for us. Let's go ahead and self-minister. And a self-minister begin praising God and begin giving praises and giving praises. And God just took that prison, just shook it and threw all the doors open. And then he says, don't leave. Huh? Isn't that the purpose? No. The purpose for the church is not to escape. The purpose of the church is to stand and change the world around it. It's not for escapism. Just like the rapture is not for escape of the church. He's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That means a church that has endured. A church that knows about self-ministering to oneself along with being an effort into the body of Christ and being a valuable, valuable part of the body of Christ. Understanding the different ministries of the prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Understanding that. Cooperating with that together. Now with our presence in the Lord, with ourselves in His presence, we come with a new anointing and refreshing. Just like in the conferences where everybody's believing for a miracle. If we came to a church like that, miracles, I guarantee you, would happen. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it in West Africa. I've seen it in Chile. I've seen it in Central America. Well, you got this guy from America coming. I was introduced one time. It's a little embarrassing, but I was introduced. In, 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 I was in Accra, Ghana, West Africa. And they, they have, there's about 16 different major tribal languages. I had to travel with four translators. And the woman got up. I don't know who she was. And she says, God has blessed us. I had to go through an interpreter. She was speaking in, her, in, in, a, in a tribal language. And the interpreter was saying, I said, what did she just say? She says, we are blessed because we have a white man here. And I, this is right before I got to get up and stand. I says, I says, you're not blessed because I'm white. You're blessed because he's on the throne. Amen. I said, and we're going to work together regardless of color. I said, and we're going to see God's manifest, and he's going to get the glory for everything that's done in this conference. Boy, I'll tell you what, miracle after miracle after miracle. Why? They came expecting. It wasn't up to me or Bill. It was, they, they came expecting. And all we did was go with the flow and just lay hands on it, just like they prophesied. If he gave me a word, I'd give him a word. And, man, it changed. And by the time we, we were there five weeks, by the time we left, man, we had, I mean, there was scores of people that got miracles. One woman was in a wheelchair for six years, got, stood up and walked. One baby was, was burning with fever. The parents handed it to me, uh, burning with fever from malaria. And all of a sudden, she lays the baby in my hands, and the baby cools down to normal temperature and stops crying. I handed her back. The, both parents are weeping and crying, and they're dancing around. Why? They came expecting. Had nothing to do with me. I'm the same person that comes here every Sunday morning. But there was a different expectancy. And what I'm saying is that self-ministry has that expectancy. So now we're seeing a strengthening that is no longer our perspective, but His. That's what God is looking for. I'm looking for people who believe me. I'm looking for people who will stand by me. i got to stop them out of time, but praise the Lord. How many got something out of the message this morning? Praise the Lord. Now, here's the choice that I just laid forth in the Word. We can come on here like every other Sunday we come here and go home like every other Sunday we go home or Tuesday night or Saturday night or whatever we do, Monday or Thursdays or whatever. But, or take what Pastor said this morning, let's meditate on it, and let's go to God and see what He would have us do different at home before we come here. And then... I expect to be mobbed on Sunday morning. Let us use our gifts. Let us use our gifts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'll smile and say, by all means, let's do it. See, I have one job description. Ephesians chapter 4. I have one job description. He that ascended is the same that descended. This is what it says in the Bible. Talking about Jesus. And he that descended gave gifts unto men. Some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be 
teach you. I'm one of those in there someplace. Agree? Yeah. What's my job description? Perfecting, maturing is one thing, also equipping. That word perfecting means maturing and equipping. Perfecting, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ so they're no longer tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's my only job description in the whole New Testament. Amen? That's it. Praise the Lord. So if I can do that, I can go be a happy camper and I can smile at the Lord and say, I did what you told me. <laughs> that's, the, that's the key pinnacle anyway. It doesn't matter what, the, what you feel the results are. It only matters that you do what God said. That's all that matters. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet and close in prayer. I took, I took an extra couple of minutes on that last one. I shared a story, but anyway. Praise the Lord. How many got something out of the word this morning? Yeah. <clears throat> Amen. David encouraged himself in the Lord. I used to think, well, that's the only one that was there to encourage him. That's not why he did it. He did it for his instructions for his next move. He never got his eye off his kingship. Never. Circumstances do not pull you out of heaven. You pull yourself out of heaven. Circumstances do not pull you out of the will of God. You pull yourself out of the will of God. Circumstances are just there. Amen? Amen. What are you going to do with them? Amen? That's, what, that's, that's a question where every person has to answer for themselves. Well, God's trying to teach me a lesson. No, he doesn't. He has the Holy Spirit for that. And the lesson is what he's already given you in the Word. Do this. Amen? Well, the devil's trying to stop me. He can't. He's got no authority. Not over you. He does over the world, but not over you. Because Jesus said, all authority begin with me. And then he said in the commission, go. When we lay hands on the sick, we cast out devils. That is proof that all authority has been given unto Jesus. Because that's, we are following exactly what he told us to do. I don't have to have any other reason, but I'll just let, do what the Bible says to do. Well, God, take the devil away from me. He's not going to. He told you to do that. He'll be silence on the matter. Told you to do it. Stand up and take authority. Amen? Yeah. Sickness and disease, it's what Jesus paid for at the whipping post. He paid the price. You have an entitlement if you believe in Christ. You have an entitlement. You're entitled to healing. <laughs> oh, I can go on and on and on. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We praise you this morning. Help us with this new insight. Well, not really new insight, but help us with this insight that we brought as a, as a revelation this morning for the body of Christ. We give you praise this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one that builds us up, not tears us down. You are the one that, push, that launches us forward, not trying to slow us down or hold us back. Amen. Never, ever. That's the devil. The devil comes only, Jesus said, it comes only but to kill, steal, and destroy in John chapter 10. He said that's the only reason to come is to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundant. We do not look at our problems as, as problems. We look at them as opportunities of promotion. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Everybody said? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, I give